Please welcome our next panel for a discussion on carbon pricing, moderated by Maria Tomei. Hi, it looks like we're all here. I'm Maria Tomei with the Hawaii State Energy Office, and I'm honored to welcome Representative Nicole Lowen, Dr. McKenna Kaufman, and Mr. Neil Dobson to today's carbon pricing panel. First, Representative Lowen will give some opening remarks. Then Dr. Kaufman will present highlights of a study completed earlier this year. And third, Mr. Dobson will briefly summarize carbon pricing in British Columbia. After the background is complete, our panelists will have a chance to talk to each other. We also hope to have time to welcome questions from the audience. So let's get started. May I have the first slide, please? Um, if I'm... Okay. Okay. So that's the list. And next slide, please. Representative Lowen, brief remarks. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Thank you, and thank you for um, including me on this panel. I feel like I'm really here to represent um, the the policymaker perspective on this. Uh, in Hawaii, I would say discussion of uh, carbon price or tax or fee or whatever you want to call it. Um, Legislation really began in earnest, I would say, in 2019, following statements that were put out by the IPCC and IMF in strong support of carbon pricing as a way to mitigate uh, climate change. And this was then echoed by the um, Hawaii Climate Change and Adaptation Commission in a statement that they put out. And so at that time, there was greatly increased public awareness of carbon tax as a part of climate action. And um, a little bit of what, in retrospect, I, I call like a carbon tax uh, frenzy both in Hawaii and nationally with a lot of different groups really fixing on this idea um, as a solution for reducing carbon emissions. Uh, but as policymakers, of course, we have to be concerned with the real world impacts on real world individuals and we can't make rash decisions without uh, being sure that we really understand the impacts it's going to have. Um, and there's also political realities that, that limit what we, what we can do and maybe we'll get more to discussion of this later, for example, you know, how high does a carbon um, price need to be set to be effective? And is it politically viable to, to jump in at that um, kind of price point? Um, but so, yeah, in 2019, uh, as a kind of starting point, we passed a bill to fund a study to look at what the impacts of carbon pricing would be in Hawaii. And that's, I think, what Professor Kaufman's going to be talking about. Um, and, you know, following that, we've continued to have discussions at the state legislature. Um, we got the results of the study we had, you know, following legislation in 2020, while we were still waiting for results of the study, of course, we had um, a bill still on the table that was in the middle of COVID. Our session was interrupted midstream, and it just seemed like there was too much uncertainty to pass a big tax bill. And then this past session in, in 2021, of course, it was just um, a lot of uncertainty still surrounding the state budget. and. And um, I think for that reason, we're still in the midst of having these conversations. So I look forward to further discussing our roles and, and hearing from the experts. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Lowen. Next, Dr. Kaufman will give a quick background on the study that was done for Hawaii. Next slide, please. Dr. Kaufman. Great, thank you all. It's nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation to join this panel. Um, and to present some of the results from the study that was uh, requested by the legislature and commissioned by the Hawaii State Energy Office. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, Paul Bernstein, Sherilyn Hayashida, Maya Sherbaim, and Sumner LaCroix. So this is very much a team effort. Next slide. Um, you can find the, the full study on the Hawaii State Energy Office uh, website. So people who are interested, I direct you to go there. But I'll just give you some of the major highlights, starting with, um, you know, first, what are our greenhouse gas emissions, right? What are we talking about in terms of reductions to meet the state's uh, 2045 net negative goal, right? So this is the most recent set of inventories uh, done by ICF and on the State Department of Health's website. And you can see that uh, really our emissions have stayed relatively flat, right? We are not in that downward um, kind of trajectory that would need to happen in terms of meeting a net negative target by 2045. 
So, you know, the, the question prompting here is what are the economic and greenhouse gas impacts of a carbon price? And how could a carbon price help us to meet the greenhouse gas reduction goals that have been stated by the state? Next slide, please. So the study used an economy-wide model um, and we looked at different uh, scenarios of carbon prices and how those revenues might be used, right? Really the scenarios of carbon prices could be endless and we had to pick a couple. So we, we chose um, the first, which is in the quotes of the $70 per metric ton uh, price pathway. And really this is the social cost of carbon estimate under the, the federal interagency working group on the social cost of greenhouse gases um, under the Obama administration. So this is a number that has been, a, you know, a few, lots of conversation, particularly as the Biden administration has come back into the Paris Agreement. And, you know, it's, I think it's a really good starting place for understanding global impacts of greenhouse gas emissions, although it's also been criticized for probably being too low, um, and the Biden administration is committed to re-looking at this. However, we take that as our starting point, right? And so with that, with a little bit of context. The second is just a much higher price pathway. We, we decided to choose a clean number ending in $1,000 by the year 2045. And there, it's really to assess, you know, how high would the price have to be in order for carbon pricing to be a meaningful player within the greenhouse gas reduction goals that have been set. Um, and then importantly, we look at two different revenue recycling schemes. The, the first has revenues going back to government spending, sort of, you know, the way that government is currently expending dollars, uh, it goes into those tranches. And the second would be as a dividend to households. So whatever revenues come in from the carbon tax, they're given to households in equal shares under that second scenario. Next slide, please. Um, and the greenhouse gas summary of this is that we find that a social cost of carbon uh, level carbon tax would reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Hawaii from their baseline levels by about 10%, right? Um, a much, much higher price pathway, a carbon tax reaching up to $1,000 a metric ton would get us 70% uh, of the way there, right? So we do see the greenhouse gas reductions. Um, it does take a very high carbon price to, to get us to you know, heading towards that ne negative goal much more meaningfully. Um, so let's keep going. In terms of economic impacts, we see that there, you know, it is, a, it is a contractionary effect to the economy, but it's relatively small, particularly in the, um, in the social cost of carbon scenario. Here you see the difference between the gray line and the light green line, green line are very, very close. That's half a percent difference. And it's important to understand that this is uh, under a scenario of baseline growth, right? So it's not that things get worse from today, it's that they get worse from what the projection would have been, which is I think a little confusing. Um, under the thousand dollar scenario, of course, the contraction is a lot larger. It's closer to 5%. And you can see that with the, the blue line out in 2045. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, I think probably this is the most important metric. It's really ch changes in household welfare. And we were able to look at this amongst different income groups. So we broke households uh, into consumption patterns by their income quintiles, meaning the highest 20% down to the lowest 20% of income groups. And we were able to do this uh, with a lot of data work from the National Consumer Expenditure Service surveys. Um, and the main takeaway of this slide, which I know is, is kind of packed, is what is above the zero line, right? So what makes households better off is the social cost of carbon with a dividend back to them, right? So here we actually find there are positive household benefits and it is actually progressive. It proportionally benefits low income households more. And this is for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is, is that it's high income households that would predominantly pay into the tax because they're the largest consumers of greenhouse gas emissions intensive um, goods and services. Um, and when that's given back in equal shares, it benefits everyone disproportionately low income households. Um, and I think that is a key takeaway for this study that there's, there's sort of the sweet spot between greenhouse gas emissions reductions and policy design that can help households um, positively in this transition. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Next, Mr. Dobson will tell a bit about what they've been up to in British Columbia, Canada. Mr. Dobson.
Thank you. Yes, well, um, I appreciate the opportunity to join everybody today. Um, so British Columbia has had a carbon tax since 2008. If we go to the next slide, we can see the trajectory of how it's grown over the, uh, the last decade and a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. So for the first uh, five years from 2008 to 2012, it went up $5 a tonne. These are Canadian dollars, of course, not the US, but uh, even so, the, uh, the parameters are similar. Um, and then in 2012, uh, really, we paused, we held at that $30 a tonne level, uh, primarily because when this was originally introduced in 2008, the, intent, the expectation was that other jurisdictions around the world were also joining us. This is around the time of the Kyoto agreements. So when that wasn't happening, we were getting too far out ahead. So we held there. Uh, in 2018, with the change of government, uh, both federally and provincially here in British Columbia. Uh, the Canadian federal government now has a target of $50 by 2022. So we are back on a $5 a year increment to 2022 uh, to get to 50. We held last year as part of our COVID measures. Um, so that's why that sort of slight flattening last year. And then after 2023 is not yet a decided thing, but again, the Canadian government have put out a proposal that they want to go up $15 a year after that point to reach $170 a tonne by 2030. Uh, so the carbon tax is across all of our combustion emissions. So it doesn't touch industrial processes, it touches the use and uh, essentially the use of fossil fuels. It's about uh, 75 to 80% of the emissions in the province here. So we just go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> we have some studies uh, done independently, not done by government, in the early years that uh, we saw somewhere between a 5 and 15% likely reduction of the impact of that $30. Now, part of what was driving those reductions was an expectation of continuing rising prices. What probably has happened since is people get used to the $30. It's a small enough level that people can just get used to that. Uh, but when it was an expectation of continual growth, it was driving down emissions through changing behaviors, changing the types of uh, heat systems or energy systems for industry that people were purchasing. Um, and our estimation is that going from $30 to $50 will knock about 1 million tons off our emissions. And our emissions are about three, three and a half times those of Hawaii, so about 65 megatons right now. In terms of the way we have built it, those early years from 2008 to 2017, our carbon tax was what we call revenue neutral, which essentially meant each year in the budget, the Ministry of Finance would uh, estimate how many dollars were coming in through the tax. And then we had equivalent tax reductions on the other side to offset those revenues. So income tax reductions for homeowners, income tax reductions for corporations, and then some other specific bits and pieces as well. That's changed since 2017, uh, but we do still have a principle that the new money's coming in with the rise from 30 to 50, we will spend more than that essentially on uh, programs, on emission reducing programs. So at the moment, you can see the numbers there on the slide. For every $5 our tax goes up, it brings in just over 200 million to government at current levels of fossil fuel use. Um, and we, we brought in an extra 200 million in 2018-19. We spent 800 on the low income tax credits, our industrial rebates, and on uh, programs such as zero emission vehicle incentives. So on the right hand side there, we've just got a little bit about some of those programs. So roughly a quarter of the population of BC gets back a climate action tax credit of almost uh, $200 per adult, $60 per child, roughly. Um, and we get, uh, we give out northern and rural homeowner benefits as well to those in the colder parts of the province or those in the parts of the province which have to drive much further because the distances between things. Uh, and then we have uh, those some of those income tax rebates that I mentioned already in place. And finally, because we're a fairly primary resource driven economy here in BC, we have to protect our industries uh, because otherwise they would become non-competitive with other jurisdictions across Canada, North America and elsewhere that don't have the same level of carbon pricing we do. So we have a Clean BC program for industry that has an incentive program in there and uh, a tech fund for investments that help people reduce. And it's the flow back of the carbon tax that the industry is paying. So next slide, please. Thank you. 
So the carbon tax increases are part of our bigger, broader Clean BC plan that we released at the end of 2018. That's online if people want to go and look at it. And that has a full suite of programs across those economy-wide ones, such as carbon tax, and also specific to individual sectors, such as a zero emission vehicle uh, piece of legislation that means no new internal combustion engine cars can be sold in BC after 2040. And we scale up to that level, uh, starting with a 2025 at 10%. Uh, rebates for zero emission vehicles, rebates for changing um, out the, the heating systems in houses and commercial buildings to electricity, as well as rebates for renovations for improving the efficiency of homes, for the recycling of organics back into energy or other circular economy systems, a communities fund for local governments, indigenous nations and others to tap into to do specific local re uh, renewable energy projects and uh, further similar programs there as well. And then grants for transit for co conversion of fleets, as well as um, building of bike lanes, building of more walkable communities and the like. There's over 40 individual uh, programs in Cycling BC. Next slide, please. And uh, so I've already mentioned that federal pricing piece, which is referenced there on the right hand side. Uh, each province is expected to reach those levels or else the federal government impose their own system on the individual provinces. In terms of BC's actions, those clean, that Clean BC plan is estimated to get us around two thirds of the way to our 2030 greenhouse gas reduction target. And this year, uh, my team and uh, folks from across all the different ministries across government are working on what we're calling our roadmap to 2030, which will be released by the end of this year and will lay out the pathways to get uh, the rest of the way to those targets. Thank you, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Dobson. Now, audience, please, uh, we do have a questions area that you can go ahead and enter questions into, into that panel. Don't put them in the messages, <laughs> put them in the questions, please. And if you like a question that has been asked, you can click on the heart and that will take that question up to the top so that we'll be able to see after their discussion, we'll be able to get to some of your questions, I hope. So um, before we go to the panel discussion, I just wanted to have this last slide um, sharing some of the links to the organization websites and encourage you to go there as well after this. So now to the discussion. Let's start with Chair Lowen. Chair, do you have any questions? Well, of course, carbon price is one type of solution to admissions reduction, right? It's an economic market-based solutions. And there are other solutions or other mechanisms. Like in Hawaii, we have um, a number of goals that are just set in policy. The 100% renewable energy, we have a, a economy-wide clean, clean economy goal. And um, you know we're starting in with some different um, goals for the transportation sector. So um, uh, the thing I think I see when I look at some of the results of, of the study or the thing I wonder is with the high prices that are proposed to kind of really see that change, right? That, that high really attaching a high price to the price of carbon would obviously be really challenging to pass something through the legislature. I think that we've seen discussion, I mean, our current the way that this has been proposed to be done in Hawaii is by, you know, kind of tacking it on to the existing barrel tax. Um, and that is currently set at $1.05 per barrel, um, which would translate to, you know, a little over double of that, that amount, which would be the price per metric ton of carbon. So an increase even to a $20 per barrel carbon tax would be a significant political lift, but in the economic model, relatively ineffective. Right, a, an increase of the barrel tax to uh, four hundred dollars or five hundred dollars per barrel. I think uh, I doubt that at the legislature that would be really challenging to get to get votes on moving that kind of proposal forward. So, um, how do those different policies play together? I guess I mean with the with the proposals, what kind of price would need to be set to outpace our existing RPS for the energy sector? I know we don't have really concrete goals for transportation and other sectors right now. But um, yeah, I think I think that it's important for people listening, especially if they're not experts on this subject matter, to understand this is one type of tool that interacts with other types of tools, of policy tools. 
You know, thank you, Representative Lowe, and that's a, a great question, and I think a really important one to understand the interaction with other policy tools. And uh, I didn't have time to cover that in the presentation, but that is actually very, we, we spend a lot of time in that in the report. So I, I urge people to go there in terms of the interaction with other policy mechanisms. And I think a, an important point to bring out in this discussion is that just because other policy mechanisms don't mention the word tax doesn't mean they're costless to the public. In fact, they have been found in study after study across, you know, glo uh, you know, global scale, national scale, to actually be more expensive than taxation mechanisms. And the reason is because they are indirect, right? You're not capturing the pollution as directly with those kinds of mechanisms as you are with a carbon tax. The politics of that, of course, I think are different than the economics of it. But um, but that is the economics of it, right? That if you directly target it, you're going to more effectively reduce it um, and at lower cost. And then you get to this issue of, well, how then do you use the revenues, right? And I, uh, Neil was really interesting hearing how British Columbia is using the revenues and how it's changed. Um, but in terms of how you use the revenues, I think that is you know part of this question of how then do you make the policies more equitable? And with other mechanisms, you don't have that opportunity, right? It might be, uh, a, well, and I'll also say that goals aren't mechanisms. You can have goals in place, but no way to meet them if you don't put the mechanisms in place. And then mechanisms that don't have a pricing aspect of them tend to not then have a redistribution, by definition, have no redistribution aspect to them. So I'll just stop there. Yeah, I think from British Columbia's perspective, we have uh, a bit of everything. Um, so essentially three different types of levers that government has, taxation levers, regulatory levers, and incentive or spending levers. And our, um, our plan is built up of all three. Um, in the regulatory space, we have uh, what we try to call sort of flexible regulations, so such as a low carbon fuel standard. So it just sets a target. It says uh, you must reduce the carbon intensity of the gasoline and diesel by X percent. And we're aiming to go, we, we were at 10% in 2020, we're trying to get to 20% by 2030. But it doesn't tell the fuel producers how to do that. So they can do that through a variety of different means through blending of low carbon biofuels. And we do have the carbon intensity on the biofuels as well, because some are not lower carbon than uh, the equivalent of fossil fuels. Um, or through efficiencies in the system, or through different uh, ways and means of actually doing that. So it allows individual actors in the economy to decide the best ways they can do that. The incentive programs, obviously government there in those instances, trying to sort of direct the market in particular directions. Uh, some of those are more open. So tech funds where you can apply based on reduction parameters. Some of them more specific, like zero emission vehicle incentives. Um, and uh, so to trying to get the right balance of those things so that different uh, stakeholders or partners in an economy are all contributing. Um, because ultimately, if government does everything through spending, uh, it still has to raise those revenues somewhere along the line. So ultimately, somebody still pays. So that who pays is a really important question. And then um, how do you manage rebates, tax credits, and other incentive programs to those that can least afford to contribute? Thank you. So, um, Dr. Kaufman, do you have a question? Yeah, I would like to ask a follow-up question to you, Neil. I'm very curious, how did, in the conversation in British Columbia, how did the amounts for the tax credit, the per-person tax credit, how did that get decided? Um, and what has been kind of the conversation around that over time? Did you know, I would. Uh, I wish one of my colleagues from Ministry of Finance was on the phone, because they would be able to answer that way more precisely than I can. Um, but essentially, it is trying to look at uh, the impacts for those lower income household groups and trying to offset those. Um, in the federal system, actually, it's more like the system that Hawaii is um, proposing, where it's actually a check that everybody gets back an equal amount in a check. So it doesn't matter what your contribution is, you get an equal amount back. I think that is a way more visible way of showing people the rebates. Uh, ours is a tax credit, so it's a little bit hidden inside the tax system. Um, 
and the exact how the exact number is arrived at is uh, part of the budget mystery that none of us even in other ministries get to fully understand. So the Ministry of Finance would have to answer that one, I'm afraid. Thank you, that's interesting. And just to be clear, it's not really a proposal so much as that was the scenario of the study, just for the audience, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah as far as legislation that's been proposed, it's, it's kind of run the gamut of different uh, options. And I think that's one of the questions that, that doesn't, um, get thought about deeply by you know sort of advocates etc how is it going to be administered which agency is responsible for it how complicated is that what's the cost to it um so there's a lot of those questions i think that that still remain for us to try to figure out if we were to implement something and sorry. i think oh go ahead sorry a representative Lauren. i think i heard you say that the plan was to attach it to some sort of barrel tax and i think that's that would be similar to the way cybc administers this we uh, use our fuel tax act uh, to administer the carbon tax. Yeah. We that would be for collecting, collecting the revenue, but as far as dispersing it back, whether it's a rebate or tax credit or, or you know, a mechanism yeah. that is to be determined, I think, or a topic of much discussion. Yeah. I see a, a connected question here that I may just uh, respond to, uh, which is that, co correct, BC has um, a 97% clean electricity grid. So one of the uh, ways that we try to encourage people to actually avoid the costs uh, of the carbon tax or equate fossil fuel prices with some of those electricity prices uh, is, is exactly that. We try to move people across to electricity. We already have a clean grid. Most of the uh, other places in the world are still trying to get to that clean grid. So moving people to an electric vehicle or a heat pump at home in BC is uh, an excellent uh, climate solution for us already because that, that grid is already clean. So that's where a lot of the money goes, is trying to push people over fuel switch towards electricity. Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, a topic of much discussion, and, and I see like I'm looking at the questions on the sidebar, and and there's been this question about um, what groups or individuals push back against a carbon fee, and I think that as this conversation has moved further along in Hawaii, there's there's like more diversity of concerns about it because equity becomes a big issue, uh, and I think the study that was done. Um, was a great starting point, but of course, it gives a general like on average households will be better off, but doesn't boil down to, you know, how are people affected in really rural areas versus urban areas or in whatever their specific circumstance might be. Um, I, th I saw, thought it was interesting. I saw um, Neil, you're the northern and rural homeowners, like extra tax credit is an interesting way of addressing that. But, you know, I think uh, to answer that question about the pushback, I mean, I think it really depends on the structure, uh, like what is the actual policy being proposed because the carbon tax can look so many different ways. And even with the bills that we've had introduced, we've really seen them run the gamut of different types of proposals, how much is given back, every from nothing to everything, and how that, how that gets used or how it gets done, what price it's set at. Um, but yeah, I think that, that there's a lot of concerns about equity and making sure that it's done the right way. And it's kind of hard to know until you do it whether you've gotten it right or not also. Um, but, uh, you know, in addition, I think we have we maybe haven't adequately addressed the questions and concerns of the business community about how, you know, we've looked at homeowners and individuals and consumers on the on the back end, but not um, how it might affect businesses or if it will affect businesses. So um, that is a concern that comes up frequently when we have had hearings for some of these proposals. I think that's um, that mirrors our experience. So back in 2008, when the tax first came in, that uh, those equivalent income tax reductions for people and businesses were one of the ways that um, our government at the time, which was a centre-right government, um, was able to uh, get support for this approach, which is really the, if you like, the fundamental premise of how taxation should be working, which is tax the thing you don't want, and take the tax off the thing you do want. Um, the challenge, of course, is in theory, a carbon tax would run itself out over time. Um, if it's working properly, it would do itself out of business. You still have to pay for the other services that governments provide. Um, so there is a balance there. And one of the ways that we have got the business community to support 
the increase from 30 to 50 was these industrial uh, programs that we put in place to support that. I know our economies are very different uh, and we still have a ways to go in terms of the small business sector and making sure that we're not overly burdening uh, that group. But in terms of heavy industry, it was based on some rebates based on how it, uh, close they were to a best in a world best in class efficiency benchmark for their production. And then uh, the remaining money is in a fund to help people continue to reduce. So cycle those revenues back to say, yes, you pay it this year. If you're already quite clean, you're going to get some of it back. And uh, whether you're clean or not, there's money available to help you get cleaner to pay less next year. Um, I'll ask a question maybe uh, for McKenna. Mm -hmm. um, is there has there been much discussion happening on the you know from economist side i mean obviously if there was a national or even international some kind of consistent carbon tax that would make the most sense for everyone it wouldn't disadvantage certain um uh, jurisdictions over others um but like hawaii is also a very unique state um you know we're small we're you know, have a lot of imports. We um, don't have a lot of manufacturing, for example. So the carbon taxes, the you know brunt of that burden is essentially borne by consumers. So, is there a discussion like about different scenarios where, you know, carbon pricing works best versus scenarios where you know maybe the the outcomes don't merit the the policy? Um, yeah. No. Absolutely. Right. And I. I think your point around the levels of jurisdiction is really important, right? I don't think any economist is arguing that regional carbon taxes are better than national carbon taxes, right? They're certainly better at the higher level. And so, I mean, you could have the same level of carbon tax, say the Obama administration social cost of carbon. At the federal level, we would expect the overall emissions reductions from that level of price signal to be much larger than you would at the state level, right? because the possibilities for substitution are just much larger, right? And you also start to bring in more of the innovation economy, right, at the federal level. So, um, so just to be clear about that, right, it's really asking a, in a second best world where we do not have that policy on the table, what should states do, right? What should provinces in Canada do? Um, and so once sort of taking that second best approach, then there, you know, I think, one of the things that I thought was interesting from what we found in the study was that there is sort of the sweet spot of being able to reduce emissions meaningfully. I mean, it's, it isn't as large as you'd want it to be. It's certainly nowhere next to the net negative goals, but I also don't think we have uh, great, I, you know, great projections of how we get there cost effectively under other scenarios either, right? Um, and carbon pricing is kind of, you know, a known most efficient uh, price signal or mechanism, I should say. So anyways, the question of, you know, is there sort of this sweet spot? I think there is in terms of a price signal that would reduce emissions, um, be able to give monies, you know, if you gave monies back, it helps people in that transition much more than if you didn't give monies back, right? Um, and one of the interesting things we found is part of the reason people are made better off, not just progressive, but actually made better off is because visitors pay into this. Right. And that is sort of a unique characteristic of Hawaii's economy that uh, that was wrapped up in that study. Right. Visitors are paying the carbon tax um, while they're on a Hawaii vacation. Uh, and what was so much of our consumption is actually visitor consumption, about a third of spending in Hawaii from um, not not including military is visitor spending. Right. Anyway, so that, that's sort of an interesting aspect. Thanks. I have a follow on question for Neil, if that's okay, kind of going in a circle. Um, Neil, I was wondering uh, how, how airline, how jet fuels is um, addressed. My understanding is it's kind of in region jet fuel is taxed, but out of region is not. Is that, is that correct? And how does that work is sort of in operation? Um, good question. Uh, the way the tax actually is administered is through the fuel suppliers at the top of the food chain, and then it kind of filters down through the different levels. So there's only, one of the, the challenges we have is not actually really knowing exactly which economic actors are paying what, because uh, the only people that actually send us the carbon tax uh, itself are the uh, 
fuel providers right at the very, very top. Um, but yes, uh, in theory, the way it works is uh, in jurisdiction airlines, so start in BC, end in BC, are taxed under the BC system. Now inside the federal system, uh, in Canada, flights are taxed and it should be applied at the point of the uh, where you leave so whichever airport you're leaving from um, is responsible for for that flight but again the specific mechanics of the way that tax works are more questions for ministry of finance colleagues i'm afraid so the actual act itself and those uh, those very specific -y things yeah i imagine hawaii has a unique scenario here with air travel too, or somewhat unique with so much of our in, our in-state travel depending on air travel um, and to impose an extra tax that then that that travel from out of state wouldn't be subject to would dis disadvantage that. So well, the way it works for our um, trucking fleets, for example, which is a similar example, is a lot of, um, again, slightly different for you for yourselves, but a lot of heavy duty vehicles start in a different jurisdictions, travel through BC to go to somewhere else. So what we do there is that it gets reconciled over a three year period following that. And they, people pay the carbon tax on the actual mileage they do inside the province. So you could fill up in Washington state, drive through British Columbia, end up in Alberta, and we would ask people to pay for the bid in British Columbia. And likewise, if you filled up in British Columbia, drove all the way across Canada, then uh, you would get a refund for the bit that was the fuel that was actually used in a different jurisdiction. So that's one of the ways we reconcile that. Um, if that's probably not much help, given, as I say, there's not much even uh, in travel. It's all in or out, probably, for the most part. Well, I'm curious to know how things like that will be changed with the, the federal minimum tax that's been set and as the different provinces start to adopt that. Yeah, all the different provinces have different systems, though. That's part of the way that our federal system works. Neil, what would you say, uh, just more broadly, like what are some of the biggest lessons learned, I guess, from when you first implemented this policy, things that have changed since then where you've had to go and, and adjust? Uh, what, what, what were the biggest lessons learned for, for you in BC? Yeah, I think... Um, Climate policy writ large, carbon tax specifically, is a uh, politically challenging uh, topic. So I think the ways to keep uh, people on side has changed over time. Uh, and initially it was those equivalent income tax credits. Um, initially as well, we uh, I think every homeowner got a $400 uh, check through the post the first year of the carbon tax. But over time, things like those tax credits, things like the rebate checks, they get disconnected in people's minds from the original purpose of those. Um, so the supplementary programs helping people to actually reduce their emissions, contextualizing it um, in real world language, because uh, I, I think McCain, McKenna and I can talk easily about the most efficient ways to do things, but uh, to the average um, homeowner, that doesn't necessarily uh, matter too much. Um, and I think the final piece of that puzzle would be giving people the opportunities to reduce. So if it becomes a punitive tax whereby I have no choice, I only ever buy, I can't afford to buy a new vehicle, so I can't afford to buy an electric car. Um, I can't afford to retrofit my house and buy myself a new you know, electric heater. I have to keep the natural gas one I've got. And the taxes are just climbing you know, year on year on year. So I think those equivalent systems like bike lanes or transit to allow people to choose to leave the car at home, the equivalent systems to help those least able to, and this is where we're now starting to pivot a lot of our policy, moving away from things like, uh, um, and this is all speculative for now, this isn't kind of in stone yet, but moving away from everybody gets the same incentive to how do we change those incentives to be more income tested to actually get to those that can least afford to uh, keep up and change. Thank you. And that is a perfect note to end our panel. Thank you again so much for being so knowledgeable and interesting and articulate. And I can tell that this is just the beginning of some excellent conversations. Thank you again.